Hello everyone. Welcome to What's Cooking with Eddie. This is a series where I talk about people, the good, the bad, and the history, while making average, non-glamorous suppers for my family of four. Today we'll be making pork chops with spaghetti squash and a nice butter lettuce salad, so my son will be crying. We are going to begin with a prep of chops and squash. You're going to uh, rub some of this rub into your pork chops, whatever spices you love the most. Uh, what I used today was garlic salt, a ground black pepper, and some Tony Saturies, which is like a um, Cajun multi-spice. And then this stuff, stuff that I have that's called a Zaharta, Zaharta. And my parents got it for me in Israel. It's a blend of Middle Eastern spices. Um, delicious, sort of chicken stock flavor. But basically I rub it all in and I kind of let it be at this point for half an hour. I just I just prep the plate, crowd them all together, and uh, rub in all these delicious little spices right into the pork chops. And then I just like, kind of let them be for a little bit. The person that is the bad guy of the week is a real baddie. He's a winner of the bad guys. The smirking jerk of the pharmaceutical world. It's the infamous Martin Smelly Shkreli, the evil farm bro, who's embraced his troll image with almost sociopathic glee. Although he is incarcerated, he is only 38, and I imagine still has a lot of havoc to wreak on this world. So let's learn about him. Martin was born in 1983 in Brooklyn, New York. He had Croatian and Albanian parents who worked as janitors and raised him and his brother and his two sisters in a Catholic attending household. He attended a preppy school called Hunter College, uh, where he tried his really best to be the emo bad guy, bandy kind of kid. Uh, but to be honest, although he would tell people he graduated from there, he actually dropped out. Uh, a teacher had said he was good at science and math, but too lazy to really apply it. Um, he would emerge at about 17 as an intern at Kramer Berkowitz, which was a stockbroking firm. He said himself that he weaseled his way into the job in the mailroom. And from there, he worked his way up uncovering biotech scams and making that work for his benefit. Anyway, he got really good at pointing out the ones that he thought were about to go down. And after about four years of this existence, he started his own firm, which at that point he made a crazy $2.7 million bet for the Lehman Brothers that never did pan out. And I mean, at such a young age, 23, he slunk back home, he shut down his hedge fund, and it seemed to be over for Screlly. I don't think anybody could have seen what was going to happen in 2008 when his enemy, the Lehman Brothers, went down in flames along with the rest of the world. Screlly was back into the world of hedge funds, starting up once more, racing to go. He started that same grift with biotech companies, betting on them failing, while adding a factor that he was actually bullying them in trading chat rooms and other places of commerce to ensure that they failed. His tactics were aggressive and his willingness to risk things was uncommon. He was really something of a psychopath without the barriers of regular human emotion to make him doubt himself or to give him self-control. It was clear he had found his strength and when he went on exploiting biotechs that were shady or didn't have a grasp on its own positions, he seemed to always make a bank. This squash is just, I just spread some olive oil and salt and pepper all over it and then I'm going to go ahead and prick those little outside shells so that they don't get soggy bottoms. <laughs> So, in 2012, he switched from a hedge fund to ownership of a pharmaceutical company because, in his words, Forbes magazine doesn't host hedge managers, they host company builders. But really, what was really happening is something very similar to what happened with the Lehmans when he made this terrible $7 million trade. But this time, instead of running away from that sort of trade, he set up a new company, Retrofin, to get away from the trouble that the new hedge fund was causing. He would tell the press and the media that he was motivated by getting attention on rare diseases. 
um, and getting the funding for that, almost like a Robin Hood of sorts. But in truth, he was desperate to get a couple of drugs under his control so he could jerk up the prices and pay back his other investors. So he took his company public in this sleazy reverse merger sort of thing where you basically just sell the stocks back to your investors. But the biotech stock world was blowing up in 2013 and everybody wanted to be a part of it. So nobody really like raised the alarm. He raised about $100 million over the next two years promising to start working on uh, their own drugs for these rare diseases, but he never did. Not only that, when the company was at its record high, he sold $4.5 million of his own share. This guy basically had zero integrity and bullied anyone who said something negative about him online. When he was replaced as CEO for Retrofin, he went out and opened a brand new company called Turing for Alan Turing, who I only know from being like, he created this law about when AI has achieved thinking for itself. It's like when it like tricks you as a human when you don't know if it's an AI or not. I don't know. That's the Turing law. Uh, it was a messy split from the old company, which Martin actually started grabbing up all the cash and assets he could on his way out of the doors. And he really left a lot of bad blood between him and several other people at the time. So at this point, lawsuits were popping up everywhere for him and harassment suits too and public fights. But it was with Turing that he was really embracing his mustache twirling villainy, Martin purchased the pills Daraprim. So Daraprim was for immunocompromised patients with several diseases, but most common was HIV AIDS positive patients. In other words, they really needed this medicine in order to thrive. Um, Turing also had ketamine and some oxy oxytocin drug launchings. So he was basically like this, like, evil trifecta of awfulness. From his vulture perch, he was able to swoop down and grab Daraprim due to the like lapses in trademark, and he pulled the pricing up from $11 per pill to $750 per pill. I mean, it was a dream come true for Martin. It was all he wanted all his whole entire life. Martin Shkreli was named the most hated man in America after jacking up prices on life-saving drugs to make a profit. He's in the price of a popular cancer and AIDS drug by 5,000% overnight. Everyone from doctors to TV pundits to presidential candidates were outraged. That's price gouging, pure and simple. He looks like a spoiled brat to me. Martin said he had to do it saying half his customers got the drug for free. For us to try to exist and, and maintain a profit, I think is pretty reasonable. Using his inner and outer golem, Martin entered into the most idiotic public fight with a band he was supposed to idolize. He bought the Wu-Tang album Once Upon a Time in Shaolin at auction for $2 million. The RZA told him it would be a great time to do something for charity, for the good of everyone, to help out his image, maybe release the album for free, but no, he kept it for himself, like his little precious. So Ghostface Killa called out Martin for being a disrespectful little goon. But I'm just, I'm just laughing off of the dude's face because it's like, come on, man, look at that smile. <laughs> right here, that plan on challenging me, the, the man with the 12-year-old body, this who he be. His name is Scarelli right there. When y'all see him, you know what I mean? The problem I had with him when I was being interviewed was that uh, he just, he has no respect for life. You know what I mean? He raised the price. You know, I've been in on him from, what, $1,350 to $750 a pill for these AIDS victims. And it was just like, yo, how could you do something like that? That's 5,000%. So then Martin made this cringy video. You're not a ghost face killer. I'm sorry. In fact, um, you know, most people don't ever try to beef with me. Do you know why? What do you guys think? They ain't stupid like Nobody's that. that dumb. Without me, you're nothing. And so even though I pity you, I have to give you some punishment. I'm sorry. I'm, I, I'm not going to let this slide. I expect you to write me a written apology from the heart. And uh, don't ever f mention my name again. Ever. Or it'll be, there'll be more, more of a price to pay than just this video. I'm out. That is just so cringy because he's just given these people two million dollars and he's dissing them. <laughs> he just gave them two million dollars for a CD. Anyway, um, 
He <clears throat> he even made a return to his supposed prep school, Hunter College, and made a million dollar donation, the largest it had ever received. But he couldn't buy that diploma because the principal would never go on record to say that he had actually graduated from there. <clears throat> he apparently bought high-priced other controversial collectibles, like the Nazi Enigma machine, and yet he wonders why everyone hated him. So when Bernie Sanders and uh, Cunningham finally put some pressure on him to reveal his finances, um, it was finally when Martin decided to take this seriously. He hired some PR representatives and lobbyists to work for him, but he just wouldn't lower those prices. That would be too much. So you're probably wondering, when did things turn for this Millennium's Uriah Heap? Well, a generic brand of Daraprim was fast-tracked and offered to the populace, and Martin might have shrugged it off, but out inwardly he must have been sweating, because Wall Street was outraged at him. The killer bees, which were like Wu-Tang fans, they were shook up and ready to swarm, and late in 2015 there was an FBI arrest for his past securities frauds. Had nothing to do with his markup. It came after him for securities fraud. They accused him of repeatedly losing money for investors and illegally using one company to pay off another's debts. Seems like his way of opening new companies and taking new investor money to pay off the old ones was more Ponzi than Fonzi. <laughs> Sorry. His lawsuit began in 2017 and his smirking, abominable face went completely viral. Do you think you've done anything wrong? On the advice of counsel, I invoke my Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination and respectfully decline to answer your question. You can look away if you like, but I wish you could see the faces of people, no matter what Ms. Redslaff says, who cannot get the drugs that they need. I truly believe, are you listening? Yes. Thank you. No, I don't ask, Mrs. Relly. I beg that you reflect on it. There's so many people that could use your help. May God bless you. It was actually really difficult for them to find a jury to serve in this trial because people kept admitting things like, I'm aware of the defendant and I hate him. Or even if they didn't know him, they'd say things like, he just kind of looks like a dick. And most people like to point out that he disrespected the Wu-Tang Clan. So... Um, his loud Facebook live streams earned him a gag order from a judge throughout the entire... Yeah, put the oven on to 350. No, bump it up to 400 and then... Yeah, bump it up to 400 and then bake these puppies for like 20 minutes. And honestly, you'll never have better pork chops. I'm never going back. I'm never going to pan fry again. Never. So, Martin was sentenced to seven years and made to forfeit more than $7.3 million in assets and cash, including the notorious album itself. <laughs> he live-streamed through the whole verdict and apparently like tried to brush it off like he didn't care, but years later, in 2013, a very different Screlly would return to the courts. Yesterday, a very different guy here. Uh, that smile had been replaced by tears as he pleaded with the judge asking for leniency. This once defiant defendant changed to an apologetic tone during his hearing yesterday, telling the judge, quote, uh, I look back and I'm embarrassed and ashamed. But I don't believe him. Like, he's still got his cronies who are buying up all this, like, stonk stuff, the stupid stuff that's going on. And, I mean... I just think he's still, he's still out there and he's still evil. For instance, he had a girlfriend who was a correspondent for Bloomberg News when they met in 2015 and she took him on, like all the mental baggage, all the problems, she broke off her marriage and froze her eggs. And she was covering his trial when she fell in love with him, but she kept it all a secret, they kept it secret for our a really long time until earlier this year actually in the spring and when she came out with it and went public he actually officially replied to her 
through his attorneys in this harsh statement release that was like, I wish you well in your endeavors. That's all. <laughs> it's really kind of sad. So now he is due to be released in a couple of years here. He's still very active, as I said. Um, he complains of being limited through email, like one email a month, I believe. So he barely has a chance to interact with his followers. But there are still acolytes who love him. I found some very annoying movies and YouTube channels that still lift him up like a god or something. But I like to imagine him like in his little, crouched in his little jail cell, like Gollum, hunched over his album like a chessboard, like mourning the loss of his precious. <laughs> And the pork chops were amazing, but the squash was a little bit mushy. I think I cooked it too long. Okay, so anyway, see you next time. Hey, if you're still with me, I wanted to end on a nice note and wipe the scrawly off my shoe. <laughs> I'd like to say hello, uh, creatives, before my videos, but really I believe everybody is creative. So right now I would love for you to go down to the comments and tell me if you're working on something, whether it's just a hobby, uh, something like woodwork or music or uh, writing. I'd love to know what you're working on. I love bonding over creative things and I really appreciate the three new followers I have. Now I have 58 subscribers. <laughs>